like a storm, Eunice. I say, Eunice, looks like a storm is blowing up. What makes you think so, Grandpa? I've never seen a brighter noonday sun. Bosh. Just like a woman. Not a weather eye and a shipload of you. Have you lived all these years among seafaring men and never yet learned that the noonday sun is no sign of the weather? Indeed. And no one more than I should know what a storm at sea can mean, whatever the signs may say. Ah! How's this for an armful? And I picked it all up on this side of the first reef. Jenny Lou, why must you be so boisterous? What are you doing with that? I saw the tide working there from the shore this morning. Tide nothing. That bottle was dropped by Captain Hagg, or I never sailed a ship. Maybe it helped him to imagine he was Skipper of the Bonnie again, like in the old days. Anyhow, his youngins helped him home again this morning, dead drunk as usual. Leastwise, that's what I heard at the store this morning. I thought there might be a message in it, so I picked it up. And I would so like to find a bottle with a message. But there is a message in it for you, Jenny Lou. Bring me the bottle. But it's empty, Grandpa. I laugh. It is empty. But it carries a message for all that. Please tell me what it says, Grandpa. Well, lass, this, it happened all of ten years ago. You were only a babe in arms on that terrific night, Jenny Lou. Yet it seemed like only yesterday. It had been a bright, sunny day like this. But I recollect that when I looked out of the northwest, I saw that same thin line of haze that lies along the horizon again today. Your father and Ephraim were working on the cap with Captain Hag on the Bonnie. I watched them bring her in and moor her snug and safe in the lee of the dock. And right glad I was to have them safe and sound for such a night, a night as all the signs pointed to. The signs were right, but I was mistaken. I was mistaken. Well, Grandpa, I'll have supper ready soon now. Where's Dad and me from? Hasn't the Bonnie come in yet? The Bonnie came in. Uh, Andrew and Ephraim stopped to batten down the hatches. They'll be along any time now. Young Earl's with them. He couldn't wait for the Bonnie to dock to border to help his big brother and his dad. I'm afraid we're going to have heavy weather before morning, Eunice. Now, Grandpa, you must be fooling. It's been a perfect day. It's no use, Eunice. You women never can see a storm a coming. How's the baby? She's asleep now, but if we don't quiet down, we'll have her awake. I'd like to have her sleep till after supper. Hello, Mother. Is supper ready? Baby's asleep. If you wake her before supper, you'll have to feed her. I see you brought me a nice fish. Hi, and it's a dandy. I pulled it out of the bowl myself. Oh, Mother, we had a good haul today. You look tired tonight, but come on and eat. A good hot supper will rest you. I'll be glad when those fish stop running. Perhaps Captain Haig will give you and Ephraim a good rest. Aye, that's easy to say, but fish aren't bringing the price they once did. We have to haul twice as many in order to earn a living wage. Skipper says we should be lifting anchor with the tide this very night. With the storm and all, I, I hope he changes his mind. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee just now for this day and for this food. And Lord, wilt thou go with us throughout the remainder of this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Has anybody seen Captain Cade go to the tavern tonight? Aye, I saw him heading straight for the swinging anchor. 
I watched him special because I thought if he kept sober, he wouldn't try to take the bunny out tonight. Then we could have that game of chess you've been promising me so long. I do wish Captain Haig would leave that awful liquor alone. It makes him so mean and foolish. And uh, isn't there some way that you and Ephraim can get a berth with another skipper? Beggars can't be choosers. Captain Haig has a mortgage on our house. And until we pay off every last cent, we're bound out to him just as legal as ship's papers can make it. Sometimes it seems like we Bartlett's just weren't meant to be free from that miserly Haig sack. Aye, so it seems, son, so it seems. I was bound to his father, same as you. It looks as if the hags have held the lives of all Stormy Cove in their grasping clutches at one time or another. I earn my freedom, and so will you. You must bide your time. Gracious, I believe your weather prediction's coming true, Grandpa. How you men can tell when there's a storm of brewing is beyond me. Mercy me, I forgot to bring in that last basket of wash. No use worrying, Mom, till we have to. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Captain Haig went out with the tide tonight. You know how he is when fish are running. Aye, and when he has liquor under his belt in the bargain. You'll not cross the bar in the face of a rising northwestern like this. Neither of you. More than a man's life is worth. The fish can go running by themselves. Aye, that's easy to say. But Captain Haig has a mind of his own. If you cross him when he's tipsy, he remembers it when he's sober. And when he's drunk, he's crazier than a pet coon. Is it? Oh, Dad, can that be Captain Haig? Aye, son. There's only one man in Stormy Cove that pounds on a body's door like that. Get your oil skins, Ephraim. We'll be needing all the protection we can get against the wind and storm we'll be meeting tonight, I reckon. About time you opened the door, Andrew. Keep me waiting while you're filling your face. Hurry up, you and Ephraim. All hands aboard. We cast off in ten minutes. And when I say ten minutes, I mean ten minutes. Aye, aye, sir. Ten minutes, sir. Aye, aye, sir. Great guns, Hag. You won't be sitting out in the face of this, will you? And whose business is it if I sail my own boat when I have a mind to? Maybe you'll tell me that. But it's murder, Skipper. Are you no thought for your men and their families? Mind your own business, you old woman. My crew don't belong to no stone circle. If they did, they'd sign up with you instead of me. We're ready, Captain. Come on, Ephraim. Stand back, both of you. No man of mine sets foot in the best boat to sail on a night like this, let alone a leaky old tub like the Bonnie. Take her out if you want to. She's your property. My son and my grandson are not your property. You understand? Say, ain't eh? Well, Skipper Bartlett, I'm thankful you give me credit for owning my own boat. But I'll be reminding you that ain't all my property here in Stormy Cove. This tidy little cottage, for instance. It won't belong to your precious son till he pays the last penny on it. I wouldn't be wanting to turn your woman and baby out on a night like this. But don't think I won't if I have to. You dirty old scoundrel, you. What's happened? Where's the Andrew and Ephraim? Oh, don't you hear that baby crying? Don't sit there like a stump. Well, Hag came, and he took his crew with him, Eunice. Grandpa, you don't mean... You must just miss them. Must have come around one corner as you went around the other. You should be pushing off this very instant. Grandpa, you shouldn't have left them. That leaky old Bonnie can't ride out a storm like this. I know it can't. They'll go around on the reef. <coughs> That wind is sure sharp, Mother. Do you think Dad and Ethan will be warm enough? Why must you talk of such things, son? Of course, they'll be cold and wet and miserable. We'll be lucky if your dad doesn't have pneumonia. 
Ephraim's young. He's not so easily affected by such things, but why he must endure them, goodness only knows. I only wish I could have gone along to help them. It's the bell at the church. That means they want volunteers for the rescue boat. Oh, Mother! What's that? I know it, I know it. Get me my outfit quick, you know. They'll be needing me. You're needed more at home this night, lad. Keep up the fire. We'll be needing lots of heat when we get back, I tell you. You're the man of the house while we're out to see Earl. And watch over your baby sister. I only wish you'd let me go with Grandpa. You'll need all the hands at the oars they can get in a sea like this. Now all I can do is stand and wait. Aye, son. Stand and wait we must. It was a poet Milton that once said, we also serve who only stand and wait. He must have had a sailor's family in mind when he made that statement. All our lives we wait, wait, while our men face death in every coming wave that pauses like a demon to hurl its towering might into that, that flimsy cockle shell they call a boat. Brave. Why, none but the brave would pull on their boots and wade into the face of a night like this with nary a whimper on their lips. Yet what about us who sit behind our kitchen stoves and count the hours that pass by those self-same waves pounding on the rocks below the reef? What kind of bravery is ours that endures a thousand deaths? while a drunken skipper gambles with the lives of those we love merely because it suits his fancy. Don't be bitter, Mother. A seafarer's life isn't one to laugh at, either for him or for his family. Yet, would you trade our windswept cottage for a stuffy place in a narrow city street? Would you have our men flee from the wind and waves only to be ground beneath the wheels that are driven like mad by the men to drink more of the very liquor that we hate so much? You wouldn't want that, Mother, nor would I. When I grow up like my father and my grandpa before me, I'll follow the sea. It may be cold and cruel, but it gives them entertainment an equal chance. The clean, cool spray of the open sea never yet put a man into a crazy, drunken stupor. Besides, we may have nothing to fear. The signal flares sent up by the bombing may not mean disaster. Perhaps they're only out of gas. Or maybe they've lost their bearings in the dark. With father at the tiller, the bombing can't be swamped. Was that the sound of voices at the dock? Run to the window, Earl. Do you see a light? Aye, there is a light. And it's coming up the path. Is he safe, Grandpa? Is Father safe? Grandpa! Grandpa! Where's Ephraim? Where's the others? There won't be any others, lad. The body went to the bottom. She was dashed to pieces on the reef. That's not your father they're bringing up there. That's Captain Haig. So that, little granddaughter, is the message of the bottle. You might think that awful night when the body went down with all hands aboard would have taught us drunken skipper a lesson. Well, for a time it did that. Captain Haig, once he sobered up, was right touched by the way he had managed to save his life. He turned over the ownership of this cottage and the insurance money he collected on his rectory to your mother. Yes, for a time he had hope for a real change in Captain Haig. But, Grandpa, Captain Haig's the worst drunkard in Stormy Cove. Aye, lass. That's the saddest part of the liquor curse. Once it makes a man his slave, it is only by the redemptive power of the risen Lord he can ever again be his own master. Gracious, I believe that's the Bonnie pulling up to the dock now. 
I'll have to hurry and get supper on the table. Or I'll be hungry after a long day at sea. I know what, Grandpa. I'll put a message in that bottle myself. Here's a pencil. Read it to me, granddaughter. My old eyes ain't what they used to be. I am poison. I think they can read that all right. Any luck today, Earl? All fair. Who brought that bottle into this house? I did, Earl. I, I... Take that out again, quick. Come now, grandson. Hold on to yourself a minute. Don't you get to worrying your fine young head about liquor bottles coming to this house. That bottle carries a message. Jenny Lou put it on her there herself. Here, read it. I am poisoned. Don't touch me. I'm sorry I got cross at you, sis. But I, after what liquor has done to, to us, I guess you can understand. <clears throat> Anyway, you sure put the right label on this. I think I'll go down and look over today's catch on the body. And as I'll be passing by the tavern, I'll take this bottle along and I'll set it down outside where the men can see it as they go in. It has a message for them if they'll eat it. <laughs> 